Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today and for helping us to welcome Learn From Leaders, which is sponsored by Dworkin and Bernstein, back to campus um, after nearly two years or a little over two years of delivering our program via WebEx. We are so happy to be live with you and really appreciate all of you joining us. I'm Connie Golden, professor and chair of the business management department. And on behalf of the department and my colleague, Professor Gretchen Skoke DeSanto, who's out in the hallway and greeted some of you on your way in, uh, we are so happy to have you here with us. Today's program will be delivered as an interview. And for the first 30 minutes, I'll be asking the questions of our guest. And for the last 30 minutes, you'll be asking the questions of our guest. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our guest leader today, Sam Shaw. Sam is the Chief Operating Officer of Red Wine and Brew and two hotels, three Red Wine and Brew restaurants and two hotels. Sam's journey in business started in 1992 when he moved to the United States from India. He came with his parents and his sister. They worked odd jobs, and his dad purchased a grocery store in Painesville in 1994. Sam has gained real-world, uh, hands-on experience start, starting and operating businesses in retail, restaurant, and hotel. And he's started them from the ground up while building leadership teams around him. So Sam, I'm going to ask you to continue the story by providing us with an overview of your career, your education, and what inspired you to start businesses in Ohio. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Golden, for the intro and also for the opportunity for allowing me to be here on the stage and also allowing me to share my experiences. Um, I would add, uh, even though the event is uh, learned from the leaders, I don't consider myself a leader. I'm just put in a leadership position, but I'm trying to become a better leader. And in my world, I look at it as it's a journey. Um, and I would quote Michael Jordan who says, you have to earn leadership every day. So from a perspective of leadership, I'm just here to share my experiences. Um, going back to the journey, uh, maybe I can elaborate a little bit from how we started, how we got here, and where are we going, and you know, what do I do on a day-to-day -day kind of. So a uh, little bit of highlight of, you know, we came from India in 92. Uh, with my sister, I was 16. My sister was 17. Uh, we were put right in high school. Uh, we came in Strongsville. The reason why we landed in Strongsville is because uh, my uncle, who lived in Strongsville, is the one who sponsored us, and how, that's how we chose to be in Strongsville. So sometimes I wonder why it wasn't in California or you know, kind of other states. <laughs> So uh, obviously when we came, um, uh, I'm sure you've seen other stories when people come from different countries and um, at a young age I knew uh, my dad, you know, kind of um, had probably $500 is what I understood back then that we had limited funds and we needed to figure things out to get back on our feet. And also there was a sense of urgency to get out of my uncle's house and get back on our feet. So we all started scrambling, uh, looking for jobs. My dad found a job um, in a chemical plant working in there. Uh, my mom found a job in housekeeping in, um, it was a um, healthcare, senior healthcare facility. My sister worked at Wendy's. I found a job at Dunkin' Donuts. So we all kind of figured out a way to leave and you know, kind of start our own journey. So, I would like to share a little bit on that um, experience that I have. I think that uh, for me, it's coming to America kind of moment that's very unique and I haven't shared with too many people, but because I'm put in the stage, you know, maybe I'll, I'll share it today. Yeah. So when we first came from, uh, you know, obviously from India, my uncle had saved a bicycle for me, thinking that, you know, because I was 16 and, you know, I wouldn't have driver license, but I'll have a mode of transportation. So. The job at Dunkin' Donuts was in Middleburg Heights, and I don't know if you know the west side, a little bit of the general area, but where we lived in Engel and Pearl, um, he showed me that you can take Metro Parks and get to your Dunkin' Donuts, you know, very quickly from the back end, so which was good, you know, and I started using that route. So while I was working there, and I, I don't know who mentioned that or how I got that knowledge, 
but somebody said, um, you know, why don't you take 71? You know, it's a very quick way because the donkey knows is right at that exit. And not knowing, or not that person not knowing, I drove a bicycle, or I, I ride a bicycle, you know, I was uh, riding a bicycle. So I found courage, uh, went up the ramp, uh, uh, you know, drove on the emergency lane, came down, and I thought that was the best thing ever because it saved me so much time and effort trying to go through metro parks, you know. So, so I, I did that for a week, uh, driving on the highway. So then one time one of the coworker, you know, kind of had a conversation and mentioned that, hey, how do you, you know, kind of drive, you know, how, how do you, where do you ride, you know, how do you get here? So I said, well, I just take this freeway and, you know, kind of it's very straightforward. So that's when his jaw dropped and said, are you crazy? You know, you, you can't be riding bicycle on, on freeway. So, so that's the kind of, and again, in my world, you know, I thought that every, everybody in America, you know, kind of drives cars because, you know, who wants to drive a bike, uh, ride a bicycle? You know, obviously I'm in that position, but nobody else wants to, you know, ride a bicycle. So that was my naive logic thinking that's a new, you know, bike lane, you know, driving. So, you know, obviously that's a unique experience that I have. And every time I see an emergency lane, it's pretty close to my heart, you know? <laughs> So we, you know, we all started working. Um, my dad was an entrepreneur back in India. You know, tried different businesses, and you know, kind of, he always had, you know, he always wanted to be on his feet also. So he has shared that you know he he would like to get into his business, uh, whatever he can find, but he wanted to move away from working factory jobs and stuff. So as a unit, we came up with a goal of twenty thousand to save in the next two years that he could figure out you know what business he could buy. So we all worked hard, uh, two years, uh, we saved up $20,000. Then back, um, I'm sure most of them not, don't realize, but back then you have to look up a plane dealer on the last page, you would find businesses for sale. So he found this uh, small little grocery store in Painesville that was for sale. And the guy wanted $60,000, and so my, off, my dad obviously offered 20000 and came up with this payment plan arrangement. So now looking back, obviously knowing the business side of it, I now realize that he had overpaid and there's not enough business and, and not even realizing that he would struggle, that you're not gonna make enough at doing 300 hours in sales, you know. So he's running the business. We all got uprooted, moved to Painesville. You know, I'm going to try C downtown, you know, I'm just uh, going further into my education and my goal was to be in pharmacy eventually, go to Toledo, and that's the counselor kind of I had planned out. So I, I was enjoying, you know, I, I had no um, understanding of what my dad was going through or, you know, kind of any stress that he was going through. So in 96, uh, he, stuff, he, he suffered um, a mild stroke, um, and that's when uh, you know, obviously, I was the only person that, you know, I could help out and my sister was not interested in involving in business or running in the business. She had no intention. So I dropped out of school. Um, I joined the business 100%, you know, kind of I was involved in that. And from there on, from 96 to 2000, we started growing exponentially and, you know, we eventually reached 7,000 in sales by 2000. So it was a very remarkable growth that we achieved in a very short period. But with that, it took a lot of time and effort and um, a lot of hard work, I would say, on everybody's part, including my mom, my dad, myself. They opened the store at seven in the morning till five in the evening. I came in at two in the afternoon till 11 o'clock at night, seven days. So we all hustled, we all worked hard, and you know, the business was getting successful. So at that stage, you know, kind of I, you know, I started bringing up to my dad that look, uh, you know, I have no education, no life, no friends, no girlfriends, you know, something needs to change, you know, kind of, because if I just keep doing this over and over again, um, is not something that, you know, I'm gonna enjoy or I'm gonna move forward. So I convinced my dad to send me back to India and let me get married, you know, kind of, so, so he gave me one week, you know. Kind of, um, <laughs> so in one week I had to find a wife, get married, go on a honeymoon and come back, back to America. <laughs> and the reason being is it wasn't something that, 
um, he had restrictions in a negative way, but it's just there was nobody else to run the business and we were, we were so busy with the volume that we were doing that uh, he didn't know how to handle it. So I achieved all that in one week. You know, I, I got married. I'm happily married for 22 years. I have two beautiful boys. My older one sitting right here, Aris. Uh, he is in. Uh, <laughs> he's in high school, graduating uh, this year. Uh, well, going, hopefully, going to Ohio State. He got admitted there, pursuing hopefully medicine. That's his goal. But I'm happy whatever he does and you know succeeds. Um, so when my wife came back in 2000, when I went back and got married, now her and I are working seven days, 365, and we have no life together, you know, kind of thing. But because she's working beside me, so after 11 o'clock we close, we go to Applebee's, you know, hang out there because they're open till one o'clock. So nothing else is changing now other than, you know, we got married, but, you know, the future is still the same, you know. So now I sit down with my dad and I told him that, look, um, I got to be on my own, I got to do something different, I got to apply myself, the, you know, I, I need to learn different skill set than what you have taught me in this, working in this business. And, and I always had a desire to build a, a hotel for whatever reason, and I think one of the reason was because of um, the management approach, the team building, that I, I knew that that industry, I could apply my skill set differently, you know, in that. So I bought that piece of land in early 2000, thinking I'll build my own hotel. And then 9-11 happened, and the whole hotel industry kind of crashed. Uh, things slowed down. So again, I had a tough period of putting a project together. Um, again, it sounds cliche, but you know, I, I stood up till 2, 3 in the morning, filled out applications all the way from California to Florida to to find one bank um, who would believe in me or would you know, allow me to you know, fulfill my dreams. Eventually, in 2003, I found a bank um, in Utah, Zions Bank, that finally came through, but they wanted to open up a CD uh, in case I default uh, because I had no experience, no background, no formal education, and obviously I was a high risk. Uh, so, we sold the store, and that's where, you know, it again shows how much um, I have to collect myself because sometimes I might get emotional, you know. So, so how much faith my dad put on me, um, again, to, you know, put all eggs in one basket, um, you know, because obviously we had zero income. We didn't know how the hotel was going to do. We worked pretty hard all these years when we came from India. So it took a lot of... Um, uh, trust and dedication on his, his part to support me, you know, kind of on my cause. So, you know, eventually the hotel opened up in 2005. I put the team together and, um, you know, I'm applying myself in the business in, in this new venture along the way. So one of the benefit, obviously, you know, that we are recouping along the way is the little quality of life that we had never seen working, you know, since we came from India and working so hard all these years. So here, my dad's sitting home, I'm sitting home, um, nothing to do, and all we do is argue at each other because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> so I told my dad that, look, this is not working. Um, why don't we open up another store? You know, we strategically, we figured out Chesterland as a new location to open up another business. So I said, why don't you start there? We'll start the same format like we did, you know, when we first opened, you know, started our first business. You go in the morning, I'll come in the evening, I'll help you out. As we grow, allow me to bring structure, people in place, team in place, and then slowly you transition out. So based on that plan, we opened that new uh, Chesterland store in 2006 with a 2,000 square feet. And, and then because this retail was kind of in our blood at this stage, we knew you know, how to grow the business. It started growing exponentially again. So in 2008, we broke the wall and doubled the space to 4,000 square feet. And the sales were incrementally growing you know, in, in that fashion. And then 2010, I took another space over and made it into 6,000 square feet. And now, you know, the store became the red wine and brew that we had intended. And it changed the name and the branding and everything. So at that time, you know, I asked my dad there, 
why don't you retire? You know, kind of, you know, I have two boys at home, enjoy the, you know, time with grandkids. Uh, let me put team in place, let me grow with it. So finally we agreed and, you know, he showed the intention to retire. So, you know, I, I didn't want any responsibility financially in case uh, the, the risk that I was taking and the way, the direction I was going, I wanted to make sure that he doesn't suffer financially. So I told him, why don't you s sell your shares or figure something out so you're not involved, um, you know, kind of from a liability or responsibility perspective. So going back to a little bit, um, the job that I had in Dunkin' Donuts, uh, fr the friends that I had made during that time, so they used to invite me at their house for barbecue and stuff, you know, during, you know. The, so when, when I used to go at their house, uh, they mentioned that, hey, you know, there, there's an Indian guy that moved right down the street, you know, I, I think you should or we should invite him so you can meet and interact and network, you know, kind of in there. So I said, yeah, I would love to meet him. So this is where the, my current partner, Dr. Patel, he was doing his residency back then and he had moved from New Jersey, you know, kind of, uh, um, I forgot the hospital, but it was on the west side that he was doing his residency. So we, we crossed paths, we got to know each other. Um, you know, um, he's from the same state back from India, so it was very easy for me to relate and, you know, kind of. So then we went our own path as we kind of moved back to Lake County and he went on his own path. But because he had built a, because I had built a hotel, he had reached out to me in the past uh, to take my input that if he invested in hotel, what should he look out for and what should he do? So I knew he had some interest in the hotel. So when my dad finally agreed to retire, I reached out to him and said, uh, look, I don't know about you or in general, even for you guys about the family dynamic, working with parents or dad, but if I can handle my dad, I can handle any partner, you know. Kind of. So I told him, let's partner up, you know, I heard horror stories, how partnership works, and if you're not on the same page, but uh, I said I have full confidence in me that, you know, I, I know how, I, how to handle my dad through communication, you know, kind of all the, so that it helped, but so we, we formed a partnership, he came on board, and then the money that we got from the, from selling that partnership, I bought this. I bought the piece of land in Mentor, thinking I'm going to grow my own red wine and brew. So as I kind of put that pack, um, process together, I realized that it's going to take a little while to put this whole red wine and brew together in Mentor. Uh, and again, it was something new that I'd, I'd never done it from ground up because we had incrementally grown in the past with little small, and then as the business grows, we grew, but we never put 13,000 square feet from ground up, you know, with a 65 people from day one, things, you know, that kind of concept. So, so it was a little bigger project. So this is when I called Dr. Patel one day in the middle of his, um, patient, you know, he said, hey, do you have time? He had no clue I'd, I had bought this piece of land or what I was intentioning or was planning to do. And one of the reasons was because, um, you know, part of Red Wine and Brew, we also sell cigar and tobacco as part of, you know, one of the product line. And him being a cardiologist, I didn't think that went, you know, hand in hand as a partner. And that was my logical thinking. And I didn't think he would be part of Red Wine and Brew because of that. So then I you know, kind of approached it, you know, called him up in the middle of his uh, practice, say, hey, can I talk to you? So he said, yeah, come down, I have a half an hour break, lunchtime. So this is when I see him in his break room, uh, one of those pharmaceutical reps at Bart Panera, so we are having lunch. And here I tell him that, look, I have this piece of land, this is what it costs, I want to open up another red wine and brew, what do you think? So he shakes my hand and says, I'm in, you know, the, um, you know let's move forward. So right, right there, kind of our partnership formed in Red Wine and Brew. And with that intention, I kind of shared with him that I, I do want to have my own brand and I want to put Red Wine and Brew on the map. And the only way to do it is I want to have my own Sam's Club approach. You know, I want a big Red Wine and Brew on the west side. Um, first, because the money is there and also, you know, uh, I, I need to have a state liquor agency to have everything under one roof. So strategically, we picked up a hard liquor, you know, state liquor store, which we currently don't have on the other two red wine and brew because we wanted to make it into this bigger 40,000 square feet red wine and brew and have everything under one roof. So, you know, he was on board with the growth, you know, the, the company would bring. 
So, you know, as we navigated through opening the mentor location, that's when uh, I learned a lot of the experiences, I guess, will eventually come out, you know, in this conversation, um, how it kind of put me back, uh, having no experience and going into our operation that's completely new, and we had to slow down in our growth before we look to rep, um, scale Red Wine and Brew quickly, you know. And that's a phase lately that from my management to operation that we have been, that we, we need to improve our operation, standardize it, and improve a lot of functions of our day-to-day -day operation before we look into scaling Red Wine and Brew and move, go into that path. But along the way, you know, one of that vision that I had shared um, also is um, when I built a hotel, I quickly realized that I wanted to be part of Marriott, even though I couldn't afford it when I built it because of the constraints and resources and not having it. And the reason part of that is uh, I always like high standard, you know, kind of in that. So with that uh, outlook, recently, you know, I, I purchased a Hilton Hotel. Uh, we're going to close in a couple of weeks, but it's one of the biggest investments that I've made so far. And hopefully that's a stepping stone for us to get it to the future goal that I've created to get into Marriott. You know, that. So that's what it brings me here today. Yeah. So, well, thank you. That gets us to the, the history and the present time. And I think with your holdings being in the hospitality industry, I think most of us are probably wondering how, what kinds of insights that you have it's because you've come through COVID and how did COVID um, present challenges to you and then how did you lead through those challenges? So, you know, obviously COVID was tough. Um, you know, you, you are going day to day, you didn't know what was going on initially. So, and there is, there was no playbook to reference it, right? I mean, especially for a small business, big corporation have all those planning in place. Um, but for us as a small business, we didn't have much. But one thing that helped um, uh, looking back is the experience that I, I, I kind of was exposed to. And, and again, most of you might not realize, but in 2017, the Chesterland roof blew off, you know, kind of. So overnight, we were faced with a situation where we are shut down, you know, kind of in a similar situation where, uh, you know, we, we didn't have much options. And again, in that context, I learned a lot of lessons where we were underinsured. But one thing that had stood out, you know, from that experience is that amazing team that I had around me that gave me a lot of support uh, from an assurance standpoint that, Sam, we got this, don't worry about it, you know, we'll, we'll get through it, you know, kind of thing. So, so some of that momentum I knew that I have good people, good team around me that will be able to perseverance, you know, kind of go through that process. Um, you know, the other thing along the way is just uh, open communication was very helpful, you know, when COVID happened, just, uh, letting the team know where we are financially. And that's another way, of, you know, also I run my company or organization, I'm very open book, what you see is what you get. All the managers are involved from top to bottom. They know. So we were able to discuss with them that this is what I have, this is the runway I have. Four weeks from now, I'm not gonna have any money left, you know, from payroll or this, you know, kind of, so things might have to shut down or things might have to change. So all that open communication kind of also helped, you know, in that. And luckily from, um, obviously the hotel was struggling and, and then as government kicked in with PPP and all that, you know, that was a nice breathing room for the momentum to keep forward. But on the mentor side of it, um, it balanced out a little bit because the retail was growing. When the restaurant shut down, you know, obviously, you know, people couldn't find beer and wine or they couldn't go out, so they, you know, resorted to drinking at home and that spiked up the retail sales. So some of the labor we were able to absorb and, you know, uh, able to retain a lot of the staff there. And because that other two locations were retail, you know, obviously we were doing well in comparatively to there. So, Overall, I would say just to, you know, kind of overview it, um, good communication definitely helped, financial planning helped, you know, kind of to put through COVID. Good. So you mentioned your father, and you mentioned Dr. Patel. Do you have any other mentors or role models that have inspired your career? 
Yeah, but I, I would, um, since we are talking about mentorship, you know, again, I would take a moment to uh, show my gratitude for my dad. You know, kind of, he's been a big influence. And the reason why I say it is, um, you know, he has taught just working side by side with him, why hard work is important. It's not about just dreaming, you know, about, you know, you, you have to put your time and you have to work hard to achieve your goals. But more than that is about family, sacrifice. So it's not about just one thing. There is, it's, uh, sorry. That's why some time uh, I was not getting emotional. So it, it's a, uh, it's a give and take, you know, kind of, so it's not that easy, but, but it takes a lot of dedication, a lot of sacrifice, um, perseverance, you know, kind of support that you have to give to each other. So those are the things that I've learned from my dad and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Obviously, Dr. Patel, when he came, um, I, you know, obviously not having education background, um, I feel like I was a little bit rough around the edges, you know, kind of thing. And because he comes from a different profession, first thing, you know, kind of that instilled me, in me that I'm very grateful of is continuous education and why that is beneficial to me as a person, but also for the business and in general, the team around me, you know, kind of. So it is because of that, I went back to school after 25 years. I started here back in Lakeland in 2015, picked up where I left off. I finished my associate's degree you know, in 2019 or 2020, so I forgot. And then I'm now at CSU uh, for my undergraduate. And it's a long path. I only take two classes every semester, but it's just the path of continuous you know, kind of improvement or education path. And, and then the other important, um, I would say, um, um, I don't know the word, but the important thing that he um, instilled in me is about emotional intelligence that relates to self-awareness and self-regulation. And, and that was so important, I, I think, to um, help you know, kind of just have a conversation about listening and understanding the other perspective and managing your emotions or managing other person's emotion. So he is the one really made me realize why we're having a good emotional intelligence, which, you know, kind of the underlying is about self-awareness, self-regulation, all that. So why all that is so important. So those are the two things that I'm ever grateful to him. And to your other question, the third person is, um, uh, you know, the famous quote is surround yourself with people smarter than you. So that's exactly uh, is, is my director of operation, Bob Zeman. You know, he's my right hand person. He has an MBA from uh, John Carroll, but he is the guy that I look up to him and he is my true mentor that I work day to day. So he is the guy that has helped us understand how to make sound business decisions, how to improve good business practices in business. And I, I think the best thing that I've learned from him is um, how to put right people in the right position, you know, kind of uh, as he looked at, as he came into our company and helped us grow. Um, so he is another person that I just look at him as my another partner. And again, it's part of my vision that I've shared, you know, with my partner also that someday I want to make him a true partner, you know, bring him as a shareholder, you know, kind of, and bring him in. But, but my point is Bob Zeman is, is, a, is one of the true reason why I'm here today, you know, because of his support, you know, that um, because the way he manages all the business, uh, he run, you know, I'm here, I'm able to go to school, look for opportunity, do other things, but the backbone is starting with him and all the rest of the team that I have behind me. So I'm, I'm, because even though I'm highlighting those three people, but there's 75 more people behind me is the reason why I'm here. So I'm grateful for all of them. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I met Sam two years ago when he was enrolled in my business communication class. So, and I have business communication students here this morning or this afternoon with us. So I got to ask, it's not an essay question, I promise, but what communication skills do you feel are important to develop or the skills that have served you well in your role? So I would say, you know, again, uh, for me, hands down is oral communication, I would say interpersonal communication because day to day you interact with people so much and you, you and for me, whether it's with my dad or whether it's my partner or whether, you know, with is with customers, you know, kind of, but, but you gotta have a good 
oral communication skill, and that kind of extends itself into you know, a lot of interpersonal, whether it's listening, you, know, um, you, you should have the ability to give constructive feedback, you know, that eventually leads to good collaboration, team, you know, kind of, so you gotta have that. And then obviously written communication, thanks, you know, obviously to Mrs. Golden, you know, business communication class kind of propelled me, you know, kind of uh, to do better on that, you know, kind of, but definitely that business communication, that written and oral, you know, is, is a key factor. And other things I would add is uh, probably, you know, um, analytical skill, Dr. Rasik's sitting right here. Uh, accounting, if you're going in business, um, again, not just because he's sitting here, but uh, very inspiring, you know, best professor, you know, kind of, I, I can't say enough, you know, kind of, but you gotta know your numbers, you gotta understand, you know, kind of, it's a little bit of analytical side of it, so you gotta have some of you know those skills, and then again, from my experience, you you gotta have sales and negotiation skills if you are going to be in business, because you are always selling. You you might be selling yourself in the community from a marketing whatever field that you go in, but you are selling your product, your brand, your goodwill, your reputation. You're selling yourself, so you gotta have good sell you know sales approach. You know kind of. And then negotiation skills you gotta have also, you know, because that affects your bottom line, where your business is gonna hand. You, 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 you know, every business, I'm sure Dr. Racer will tell you, have those uh, operating costs, all those line items, and you, you should be able to source your vendors and negotiate them so your bottom line, you know, kind of gets bigger. So to your point, you gotta have both of those. Uh, so where would you learn or develop? I would say, obviously, school, you know, taking classes with amazing, pro, you know, Mrs. Golden, Dr. Rasek. I would even add um, um, the um, public speaking class was also amazing because it, it also helps, you know, to be on the stage and not be nervous. And for that, uh, Professor Dobbs, you know, I don't know if she still teaches here. She was amazing, you know, if you ever choose to take public speaking. Um, uh, critical thinking is also very important. Another class, uh, um, Professor Dave Port, you know, is amazing. That helps you with your decision-making skills. So school is a good venue to learn. But the other way I, I would also highlight um, the way I've approached it is there's always situational issues that come about, you know, but if your goal is to do better at it, you just have to go back and assess that. What was the result? What could have done better? And just by asking that question and assessing yourself, you'll keep improving a lot of these communication skills that you need to get better at. So in your, as you were giving us your background, you pretty much indicated you did not have a work-life balance there wasn't a, you didn't have a good balance and and you worked to get that so can you share with us some of your suggestions for um, maintaining a work-life balance yeah uh, it is a tough proposition for me to answer because i i almost feel like it's a twofold one one side of the coin that I have personally experienced and just knowing the business side of it that if you are going to venture into the business, it takes a lot of hard work, dedication, long hours. So there is a trade-off, right? You know, so you know, the trade-off is work-life balance. You know, so either you pursue your goals and there's a trade-off because you you you're gonna make sacrifices along the way with your personal life and so you know, that imbalance is gonna start coming in in that. So you just have to recognize that um, there, there, are, there are trade offs that's gonna happen and it's not a straightforward road, you know, kind of. But the other side of it also, there's always a pivotal point, just like maybe with my journey or things like that. You, you just have to recognize that it's, it's never always one extreme or the other. You you can never, uh, again, in my opinion, in my world, you, you can never be always 100% work-life balance or you can 100% be, you know, kind of working hard all the time. So you just have to navigate. And the analogy I use is if you're driving and if you like cross the yellow lane, you're not gonna just keep driving on that other side. You know, you're gonna steer and you're gonna readjust and you're gonna you know, recalibrate yourself, right? So. So it's not a one path, but it's a recalibration approach that you see based on situation or what's going on. But the end goal is um, 
from a service industry that we're in, it's customer facing. So if you know, we, we have to be there. But if you work in engineering and you can work from home, so a certain industry has a lot easier to uh, you know, kind of provide a work-life balance. So just knowing all those distinctions based on the business or um, career that you pursue. Okay. So I want to leave enough time to um, turn it over to you to ask some questions. But I have um, just two more that I'm going to float out there. And so be thinking of your questions. Um, if you were to do one thing differently in your professional career, what would it be? I would get experience before I experiment. <laughs> so that's a hard lesson that I've learned, like I shared at the hotel. You know, I built from ground up with no experience, you know, kind of, that was pretty tough. Uh, restaurant, you know, this catering that we built upstairs with zero experience. Uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, if, and again, I, I hold myself not to make the mistake because my personality draws me in that because I like challenge, you know, kind of. So the challenge is a why, you know, I like that unknown and going, but that I would not recommend that, you know, kind of for, so. <laughs> And then my last question, and I will turn it over, is what advice would you give to future business graduates? You know, I think like I shared, um, you know, you got to be wholesome, you know, kind of well-rounded in that. So get experience, you know, th there's no substitute for getting those real life lesson experience when you go out in the world. But at the same time, this, um, 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 the education part of it is also priceless. So if you have both, you have a little bit of um, this hard skills and soft skills, you know, you, you have the combination. And the better off you are having both, the more educated decisions you can make when you, you know, kind of go into the business world. Um, so just having both sides of it. So again, uh, highlighting that experience part, you know, is important and then education is important. And then I would say because, you know, young students, you know, if you're graduating from business and going after it, I would say time is on your side. Your risk appetite is big. So take some chances and go for it. You know? But again, you know, make those educated decisions, have a business plan, uh, you know, have all those certain things that are fundamental before you just jump in, you know, kind of and move forward. Right? Okay. So I have more questions, but I'm going to turn it over to you. Yes. Pretty loaded question there. Yes, <laughs> well, you know, again, it goes back to, you know, when you when you are young um, and when you don't have this broad uh, or breadth of you know, knowledge or wisdom, how to manage it. It is tough. Um, psychologically, I wouldn't lie, you know, kind of I had a tough time with my dad mostly, you know, kind of because of those different uh, wavelength that, you know, kind of generational gap, cultural gap, you know, kind of thing, vision, you know, kind of where I wanted to run my business or, you know, how to grow versus I needed my, so it, it was really tough, but again, one thing, that led me in a positive direction is because I valued relationship always and which I've always shown in my, you know, kind of team around, you know, so it's always been my priority, especially as a family. I've always seen, you know, kind of when you come to America, it's struggling, you know, kind of you, you, you don't want to desert, you know, kind of you're all in together, you know, kind of thing. So that holds that glue together and you find a way to work together. And what I have always found is if you, you know, can communicate better. So anytime you get frustration, um, it just leads to, you know, it doesn't lead to anything positive. But if, if you just find a way to communicate better and get on the same page, it gets better and better. And that's what I always used with my dad or any, any issues I had. So I, I chose a higher path of communication to get on the same page. And, and a lot of time, it is about um, letting it go forgive and forget kind of mindset also, you know, because um, when you're young, you got ego, you know, you, you got drive, you got this, you know, kind of, and, and those are the things that, you know, sometimes my dad reminded me, sometimes I had to remind myself, you know, kind of, so those are the things you have to balance, you know, 
so I, I don't know if it's a clear answer. I don't know if I answered your question, you know, to that. But it is tough, you know, it's, it's not that easy, you know. <laughs> and, and I think my son can vouch for it, you know, as, as he, you know, because as, as our culture, you know, I'm, I'm sure, I, I don't know if too many people know, but, you know, my, my parents, we all live under one roof, you know, kind of. And, you know, I have a history with my dad, you know, working in the business and how he operates and how he thinks, you know, kind of thing. So even because we, he's not involved in the business, but we argue about everything, you know, kind of thing. But end of the day, w you know, we love each other and, you know, kind of, so, so there's a dynamic, there's different, but end of the day, the relation supersedes, you know, kind of any disconnect that you might have and that helps you deal with those dynamics, you know, right? So, you know, again, I, it's, uh, I won't take all the credit for, you know, kind of, I didn't come up with it whole entirely. So as we are 2010, you know, I shared as we are growing the Cheslin location, you know, kind of into that 6,000 square feet, that was the last part where we grew and I wanted to change the name to match. So I wrote a piece of paper down, you know, kind of, and asked all my customers that, hey, we are changing this name and I would like to take input, you know, kind of, do you have all the suggestions? Uh, you know, that come. So part of that, somebody wrote down red wine and beer, you know, kind of thing at that time, or something along the way. Uh, it was similar to our name, you know, kind of, that was, that was in the lineup. Everybody was happy to give suggestions, you know, kind of in there. And this is where eventually, because I wanted to open up a brewery, that was always my, you know, kind of just a fun thing I wanted to do, a microbrewery. And that's how a mentor, uh, and again, I, I don't think I shared, but the catering upstairs was supposed to be a micro microbrewery. And just, we could, just couldn't secure the license because the liquor license doesn't allow you to have a retail store. You can have a restaurant and a brewery, just like you see a restaurant and a brewery. But if you have a retail store, you can't have a, you know, brewing license, you know. So eventually that became catering. So with, with that vision that I had at that time to do get into the brewery, I converted into a red wine and brew was that name that I had chosen back then. You know. So that's how the name came. So it was with input from customer and then you know, modifying it a little bit. So. Again, from my perspective, you know, I, I didn't come across like any hurdles from a danger perspective, but I would say when I look back, um, some of the dangers that I would fall in the trap in the same time is not knowing your own strength and weaknesses and or qualifying yourself that, you know, I can handle this business when you can't, you know, kind of, that's not in your wheelhouse. You don't have that skill set. You don't have that ability. So sometime you, you don't have the ability to ask for help, you know, kind of thing. So you become too overconfident when you're in business or, or sometime when you're passionate about uh, idea or something, you know, kind of, you, you, t you get a tunnel vision, you know, kind of. So that's the trap that I would be careful of, you know, kind of. But other than that, yeah, it's more about planning is where most of um, that avoidance comes in, whether it's financial and all those other things, make sure, you know, you're able to sustain or see through uh, your uh, vision. You know. You know, for me, uh, for me picking the team is usually the people around me immediate, you know, because I have given a lot of autonomy and um, so I'm not involved in picking out. So my director of operation was the guy that was most important to me, you know, kind of because he is ultimately the representation of all the businesses. He's the one that goes to my each location and meets the managers and so, it's more up to him to pick his team going forward. So if there's a turnover on, and we have, to, we have to pick a GM for that location, he is the one who makes the ultimate call. But I, I give him a little guidance in the back, you know, kind of an input and things like that. So I'm not involved in, in that. But part of my outlook, you know, kind of that I share always is, um, you know, it goes hand in hand, you know. You, like it's just a basic principle, you know, if you have, uh, you know, if you have happy employees, you have happy customers. 
And if you have happy customers, you have happy business, and you have the happy bottom line that, you know, it's just basic, you know, kind of, right? So it's, it's not like a one thing. So just like work-life balance, what's important, what tools we have given them to succeed, how much resources we have. And again, this is a hard thing that I, um, I mean, maybe I can share a synopsis. I don't know how much time so it am I taking, you know. Kind of. So before, you know, before, before I got the first job at Dunkin' Donut, you know, kind of, I was taking my, uh, I was riding my bike on Pearl Road, you know, uh, where my uncle used to live. And there used to be a guy who actually used to own a beer and wine store. He was an American guy who was just sitting outside and enjoying the weather, you know, kind of as I drove by. So I asked him that, hey, do you need any help? You know, kind of, but I don't have my green card yet. You know, back, back, that, back in the day, it took a week to come in the mail, you know, kind of thing. So I said, I don't have my paperwork or anything yet. Um, you know, do you, you know. So he says, yeah, no problem, you know, kind of uh, the, try it out if you need it, you know, kind of, you can. So it says, go ahead and start working, you know, kind of thing. So, he, you know, there was no training. You know, I didn't get any training, you know, kind of thing. So I started doing everything on my own, you know, kind of. So just hold that thought. So the thought that I was trying to relate is, it's very important to have training before you ask somebody, hey, how did you perform, you know, kind of. So though that's a big thing that I'm trying to improve our operation and organize that, make sure that we have done our part, you know, kind of to support before, you know, they become. So, <clears throat> But one another important lesson that I learned in that part, you know, that that person had also taught me, is um, it was like a maybe 500 square feet store, you know, kind of. So and he is just sitting outside, you know, kind of just you know saying hi to the customer. When the customer comes in, he checks them out, you know, kind of thing. So I'm inside, and you know, coming from India back, you know, um, not having much, you know, kind of not having access to candy, you know, kind of we 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 didn't have luxury, you know, kind of um, you know, not that we are poor, but at the same time, you know, we didn't get much stuff. So yeah, I would love a bubble gum, you know, I didn't you know have. So I was so amazed and wondered that why isn't this guy worried that I'm going to steal, you know, kind of. So, I, and I asked him that, that, aren't you worried that I'm going to take this candy, you're sitting outside, you're just asking me to be here. He said, no, Sam, I trust you. So that's the part that I, 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 I have it, at, you know, I ingrained in myself that I would never break somebody's trust if, if they put it in me. You know, it's so valuable that, and that's part, you know, that's part of the process that I take it forward, you know. So that applies into the management, you know, kind of philosophy and how I approach my business. Uh, and I use it as a head principle, you know. So honesty is, is one, one thing that I look for in, in, as a culture in our organization. There, there's nothing what you see is what you get, and I operate, you know, both ways, you know, from there. Attitude, you know, kind of, so we ap approach with, you know, very um, positive, approachable, you know, kind of, there's no hard feelings. And then trust, transparency uh, are those core principles that I, I have ingrained, you know, is how I operate with. Yeah, it goes back to the risk that we talked about, not you know, understanding, not having experience, no knowledge. So for me to open up a microbrewery was, was in the same risk as opening up a restaurant. So unless I was a brewer or I was a garage brewer, like if I had some kind of passion or knowledge, then going in that route will take you further. But somebody like me, it, it, it's almost like Shark Tank when you watch and Mr. Wonderful says it's a hobby, you know, it's not a business. Yeah, exactly, this is where it belongs. You know, it is a hobby and not a business because it, you're not gonna go that far, you know. Kind of, so you gotta have some more substance if you go into that kind of specialized, you know. So for me, um, I was looking at a broader scheme that it fits into my business model and it allows me to incorporate, you know, the retail. I have a lot of other similar products. So I didn't have to be, you know, kind of, um, I, I, don't, I didn't need to master that knowledge or product knowledge or ability to brew and things like that. But I just needed to have right person. So I, I actually had recruited one of the head brewer. He was uh, Don Trivasano back then from Willoughby Brewing to when Red Wine and Brew was opening up, he was already on board uh, to be our head brewer and everything back then. But as the license didn't come about, you know, he 
he kind of managed our beer department, then eventually he transitioned out, you know, because, you know, his passion was in a different field, you know. But um, to answer to your question, um, how open were we to other breweries? Is that what you said? Yeah. Newly started up breweries or microbreweries. Do you, do you mean like to carry their products or? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we, we actually collaborated with, uh, there was, uh, a uh, brew mentor. I don't know. They're they're on um, Heisley now. You know, kind of on, on Diamond Center, right across from the movie theater. They moved their location, so we actually collaborated with them in mentor when we first opened. You know, kind of because they were brew, um, uh, they sell supplies and we kind of gave a space with their name. So we are always looking for collaboration. And even in my, you know, that's still part of my bucket list. You know, to be in a microbrewery. But you know, nowadays, obviously. You know, there's a lot more, and there's a lot more competition, and but it's just more of for a fun side of it, you know. So. I would be hesitant to do that just because um, I don't know the market. You know, kind of uh, every business, you know, is different. You know, kind of the customers are different. Uh, you know, the supply chain, you know, there's so many pricing, government regulations, you know, kind of, there's so many laws, you know, are different. So because at a young age I came and, you know, I'm now I'm ingrained in, you know, the um, American business, you know, set up, it's very hard for me to relate, you know, kind of from, uh, so unless, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know if I would be able to open up a beer, wine, or restaurant, or, you know, but maybe a hotel could be in the wheelhouse, you know, if that, but, but I never thought in that context. <laughs> well, you just reminded something that has a knot in my stomach. <laughs> well, that has been a pain point for last, so what's your name? Jim. Jim, yeah. That has been a pain point, Jim, and you know it's been a struggle. Um, I have a whiteboard in the office. We've been work. I actually reached out to Case Western through networking. Um, they have a supply chain unit, a professor there, who sent few interns to look at our you know kind of processes and see how we could improve. Um, so it has been struggle, you know, kind of. It has been a pain point and. We haven't found a solution, and we are looking for it. And that's one of the reasons why we don't want to grow red wine and brew till we figure all those things out. Yeah. So, yeah. but thank you for reminding. <laughs> you know, I um, again, I'm trying to relate. Um, so. You know, the, sh the struggle I, I think I shared was at the hotel side of it is where we didn't have money. And, but again, bank is the only true access, you know, usually, you know, depending on the amount of money you need. And, you know, so to get there, you almost need to become credit worthy, right? You know, so, you know, e even people close to you would be reluctant to pay you if you don't have a history or they don't trust you. So bank, you know, kind of when they hand you their money to or anybody at that, you just have to become credit, wor credit worthy. So you just have to figure out internally to get your ducks in a row, you know, kind of approach that make sure your fin finances are in a row. Do you have enough to pay the debt back to your, you know, kind of lender, you know, things like that. So till you financially plan, it's very hard for to go and, you know, kind of extend your hands or give me some money, you know, kind of. So, so I, I don't know if it's one straight answer, but it, it goes to just internally, you got to make sure that your financials are ready and before you ask for it. So, does that answer? So, okay. so um, as we wind things up, please join me in um, thanking Sam for his time today. Thank you very much.